and our challenge that's before us to be faithful to God, and especially in these days in which we live. Let's be faithful to the word of the Lord this morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me in uh, the book of Colossians, the letter uh, from Paul to the people in Colossae, we come to the conclusion of this great letter this morning, Colossians chapter 4, find verse 10. And we're going to pick up and right there, and we're going to work our way through the remainder of this chapter and uh, this letter this morning. You know, Paul has been addressing the subject of relationships. We've been looking at the relationship within the marriage between husband and wife, the relationship in the family between parents and children, the relationship at the workplace between bosses and, um, and employees. Last week, we looked at uh, some of Paul's relationships, some of uh, his friends. We met two guys, one by the name of Tychicus and the other by the name of Onesimus. We learned some things about what it means to be a, a real friend. And this morning, Paul shares some names of several other people. And in these names, we see stories of individuals. And in these individuals, we really see the heart of people and we see the heart of the Apostle Paul. You know, you can learn and, or come to know and a lot about a person by the friends that he has. You can come to learn a lot about a person by the company that uh, he regularly keeps. And so let's look at some of Paul's friends this morning. And he really sends uh, here in verse 10 a greeting, a greeting from this, this gang of friends of his. Verse 10, follow along as we look at the word of the Lord this morning. Aristarchus, that would be my third child's name if I was to do that. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Beginning in verse 10, Paul names three specific individuals, and these three individuals all happen to be Jewish. In fact, Paul points out there for us in uh, verse 11 that these were the only Jewish believers who were with him at this point or this period in his life. We see Aristarchus, the first one mentioned, mentioned in verse 10. He was a Jewish believer who was from the city of Thessalonica. Notice in verse 10 how Paul describes him. He describes Aristarchus as my fellow prisoner. Now, if you were here last week or you want to jump um, back a few verses when we were talking about Tychicus, Tychicus Paul described as a fellow servant. Here Aristarchus is described as a fellow prisoner. Now do you remember where Paul was writing this letter? He was writing it from jail. He was in prison. He was in a Roman prison. There's no indication that Aristarchus shared a cell with him or that he was in any way incarcerated alongside of Paul, but he was a fellow prisoner in the sense that Aristarchus never left Paul's side. He was there with him the entire time that Paul was in prison. Aristarchus didn't wear Paul's chains, but he shared in Paul's hardships. That's one thing we can see about a friend. A friend is one who sticks closer than a brother. A friend is one who shares in not only your good times. you got lots of friends when times are good. You ever notice that? Well, when times are good and everything is zippity doo da, zippity a, you got friends everywhere. But when times get tough in your life, that's when you really find out who your friends are. Aristarchus was a true friend, a fellow prisoner. Notice in verse 10 that... Paul mentions another man here. The second one he mentions in verse 10 is a man by the name of Mark. Now, who is this guy? Well, in verse 10, Paul identifies Mark as the cousin of Barnabas. This is the same Mark who is also called John Mark, who traveled with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. You can read about that in Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 14. And you'll find out very quickly in this story on that first missionary journey that when uh, Paul and Barnabas started off, that Mark was there with them. They traveled a little bit. Mark's presence in that group didn't last very long. 
We read in Acts 13, verse 13, that when the missionary team arrived at a place called Perga, that Mark decided, I've had enough. And he turned around and he went home. Well, some things happened as a result of that. Mark's departure from the group there, from the team, caused a break in his relationship with Paul. They were pretty close up until that point. When, when Mark decided to go home, Paul didn't have much use for him after that. And that existed for, we don't know how long, but I, I kind of assume it was for quite a while, that there was this breach in their relationship. Maybe some of you today have a friend, and you used to be pretty close, but something happened. Something was said, or something was done, whether it was intentional or it was unintentional. And that friend that was close to you now, you haven't spoken to in weeks or months or maybe even years. Well, Mark, we read about in his story, he eventually ends up with Peter. He eventually ends up kind of as Peter's, uh, under his mentorship. And during Mark's time with Peter, Mark had a, almost like a life-changing experience that he, he became a changed man. And it was through Mark's association with Peter that his relationship with Paul was restored, that they were able to come back together and so at this point where Paul is in prison in Rome, that he can mention the name of Mark and say Mark's name with a smile on his face. That this man who had at one point almost been written off by Paul, that one who was useless to Paul had now become useful to Paul. That that relationship had been restored. And folks, I'm reminded through that that God is a God of second chances. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that God didn't say, I'm giving you one shot at this, and boy, if you blow it, that's it. Because we'd all blow it. We'd all be in a lot of trouble. God is a God of second, sometimes third, sometimes four, sometimes multiple chances. God gave Mark another chance with Paul, and they were able to come back together again. Look at verse 11 and notice the, the name of the third man that Paul mentions who was with him, this Jewish fellow who... Has, has a great name. Do you see it there? His name was Jesus, who was also called Justice. Jesus is the Hebrew name for Joshua. And what that name means is it means Savior. It means God saves. Justice is the Latin version of that. The, the, the Latin version of, a, of the name Justice means righteous. So this fellow, Jesus preferred to be called justice. And that kind of makes sense to me. I don't know about you, but this fellow, I kind of picture him thinking that he recognized, I can't save anybody. I mean, that's something only God can do. But I sure am glad that God saved me. I sure am glad that God in his grace and in his providence reached down out of heaven and into my heart, saved me from my sins, and made me righteous again. I could be, actually be called justice in my life because God sees me as righteous. Now notice in verse 11 that Paul refers to these, uh, these three men here as those who are of the circumcision. Aristarchus and Mark and, and Justice were Jews. Now notice in this relationship, verse 11, Paul says that they proved to be a comfort to me. That Paul experienced comfort from his friends. Not only were they present and not only were they able to encourage him with their presence and with their words, but they were fellow believers. And not only did Paul share the commonality of their, of their faith in Christ, but they also shared this common heritage, that they all were from a Jewish background. So they had a similar culture as well as, as a similar life-changing experience with the Lord Jesus. These were Paul's fellow workers. Look at verse 12 and notice the names of some faithful friends that Paul mentions. In verse 12, Paul, Paul writes, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Verse 13, For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and for those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Paul mentions in verses uh, 10 and 
11, three Jewish friends. And here beginning in verse 12, he mentions three Gentile friends. The first person he mentions, verse 12, is a man by the name of Epaphras. We see in verse 12 and verse 13 some uh, very uh, interesting and some very important details about this man's life. Notice in verse 12, uh, Paul says, he's one of you. He was a Colossian. Epaphras was from the city of Colossae. We believe that he was saved under Paul's ministry in, um, in Ephesus. And then Epaphras went back from Ephesus back to his hometown in Colossae and started a church there. We believe that Epaphras was the pastor of the Colossian church and that uh, he led that flock there. Secondly, we see in verse 12 about Epaphras that he was a minister. Do you see it there? Paul says he is a bond servant. And that word literally means he is a slave that Epaphras had set apart all of his own personal goals and his personal preferences and his wants in order to focus on serving the Lord and serving and leading the people at the church in Colossae. But that's not the only things that we see about Epaphras. Look at verse 13. We see that he, verse 12 and 13, that he is a mighty prayer warrior. Do you see it there? Verse 12, Paul says, Epaphras labored fervently in prayer for the Colossians. Uh, the, the phrase to labor fervently, that's one word, and it, le and it literally means he agonized over prayer. Have any of you ever prayed like that? Have any of you ever been so concerned about someone or, or, or you're so concerned about something that it, it, just, it breaks your heart and you just can't stop praying for it, that you agonize over that person, you agonize over that situation. This describes how Epaphras prayed. He prayed with agony over his people. Notice that Paul shares some of what Epaphras prayed for the Colossians there. In verse 12, do you see it? That you may stand perfect, we read, and that you may be complete in the will of God. The word perfect means to be completed, or it means to be finished. And the word completed there literally means to be filled, to be filled up. So Epaphras is praying here for the people in Colossae that they would become completely transformed into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ and that each one of them would be completely filled up with the Holy Spirit. Are you praying for somebody like that? Do you have somebody praying like that for you? You know, we all need a friend like Epaphras who is a prayer warrior who is lifting each one of us up in some way at some time before the throne of grace, praying for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives that we might become conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ and filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit and led in the power of the Holy Spirit. If, if you don't have a friend praying for you like that, pray that God will give you a friend like Epaphras or e Epaphra, Epaphra, whatever, I don't know what the female version of that would be, but you know what I'm trying to say here is that ladies pray that God will give you a female friend that'll pray like that. Men, that God will give you a male friend like that who will pray for you in that way. Why? Because that's God's will. You know, God's will for each one of us, Paul writes, is our sanctification. God's will, his desire for your life, is that you would be completely changed from what you are into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever wonder what God's doing in your life? That's what he's doing right there. He's working to make you into a different person. Guess how long that's going to take? It's going to take your entire life here. Uh, you, you will not, God will not be done with you until it's time for you to take your last breath here and wake up in heaven. God will be continually working out that part of his will in your life that you would become like Jesus, that you would be transformed and conformed into his likeness and his image. Notice that Paul notes something about Epaphras. He, he points out Epaphras' great zeal. That Epaphras was zealous for the Lord, and he was zealous for others. You see it in verse 13? He has great zeal, Paul writes, for you and for those who are in Laodicea and in Herapolis. Now, if you were to look at uh, your map in your Bible, Laodicea, we've heard of that church before, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but there was also a church in Herapolis, and these were cities that were neighboring cities to Colossae. In fact, Laodicea was about... Uh, six miles to the north and the west of Colossae, and uh, Herapolis was about 20 miles north of Colossae. 
Epaphras was a man of great zeal. But we would also say that he was a man who had great vision and who had a great heart for people. He cared about his church. He cared about not just only his church, but he cared about his local community. And he cared about the people who lived in neighboring communities. He cared about people, those who were close to him and those who were around him. And folks, we need to be like that. We must guard against becoming so inwardly focused, so, so focused on ourselves or so focused on what's happening inside the church building. We have to guard against becoming so inwardly focused that we forget our neighbors or that we neglect our neighbors. And then the opposite is true. We must be careful that we, we don't become so outwardly focused that we forget to take care of our own. There's got to be a balance in ministry, a balance between ministering to the people of God because the people of God, of God are compelled to go out and minister to those who are outside. You know, if God's people are not being fed, how can the people who are lost hear? How can they be ministered to? So there's got to be a balance in our vision. There must be a balance in our work to reach others for the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 14. Paul mentions two other men. Verse 14, he just simply says, Luke, the, be the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Now we've heard of Luke before. Luke here is described as a beloved physician. The word beloved is the word that means precious or it means dear. Uh, Luke was a medical doctor. He was a constant companion of Paul. He traveled with Paul on a virtual all of his missionary journeys. But not only did, did Luke take care of Paul's medical needs, but we also know that Luke was much of a historian. He was much of a writer. He was much of a researcher that uh, Luke researched and he recorded and he wrote down for us. And praise the Lord that he did because we have the gospel of Luke because of his work. And we have the book of Acts because of his work. Luke is the beloved physician. But notice in verse 14 that Paul mentions one other guy. He mentions a fellow by the name of Demas and he only calls him by his name. Demas shows up in the book of 2 Timothy as uh, not really a great guy. Demas eventually turns away from his faith and deserts Paul. Paul just mentions Demas by name here. Maybe Paul's beginning to see something that's, that's not exactly right about Demas' life here. Maybe he's beginning to see some problems developing in Demas' commitment to the Lord or in his faith. So he only mentions him by name. But notice this. We see three Jews and three Gentiles. Paul had three Jewish friends, he mentions, and then three Gentile friends. And these six men were present with him while he was in prison in Rome. So let's think about this. Paul's friends were evidence of his heart. They were evidence, if you think about it, of Paul's transformed heart. Think about this. Before Paul was saved, he was called Saul the Pharisee. And Saul the Pharisee would have never had anything to do with a Gentile. He would have never had anything to do with a Christian that was good. But Paul, the saved man, Paul the apostle, he embraced anyone and everyone who was lost. It didn't matter if you were a Jew or a Gentile, if you were male or female, that, that, that Paul wanted to be your friend. And he wanted to share with that person about the Lord Jesus. We see that Paul had a transformed heart and in that transforming work of God in his life that Paul's heart was for people he cared about people he loved people but not only do we see these fellow workers and these faithful friends look at verse 15 and we see a personal greeting that Paul gives here verse 15 greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house. Paul adds his personal greeting here to uh, several people. One is a fellow named Nymphus, and then to the brethren who meet in the church there in Laodicea. The church apparently in Laodicea met in Nymphus's house. And if you recall from scripture that the church in Laodicea was a wealthy church. They, they had wealthy people. They had a lot of resources. 
uh, they had the ability to, the ability to do a lot of ministry to help out a lot who were a lot of people who were in trouble but they were also not only a wealthy church they were a church that was in spiritual trouble jesus points that out in the book of revelation revelation 3 verse 17 jesus said to the church in laodicea because you say i'm rich and i have become wealthy and i have need of nothing but the reality jesus said is that you do not know that you're wretched miserable poor blind and naked the church in laodicea didn't realize the kind of trouble that they were in they thought that they had everything that they needed and you know that's a danger that the church in america faces today is that the american church churches in america have so much and the danger is in all of our excess that we think why do i need god i've got a full bank account i've got all kinds of people with all kinds of talents i've i've got everything that i need in order to be able to to do ministry and to win the loss and to build this church and to become a great in the eyes of our community folks without god we are nothing without the lord jesus we are nothing and without prayer we can do nothing jesus points that out here Paul greets Nymphus and the believers in Laodicea to remind them that he cared and that he was praying for their church too, even though they might have been struggling. So look at verse 16. We see greetings here. And then notice that we have a greeting from Paul and some guidance that Paul provides for us beginning in verse 16. Paul writes, Now when this epistle is read among you, See that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. The word epistle means letter. If you ever wonder what that, that, uh, that big um, Christian-sounding kind of word just simply means a letter. And, and Paul here commands the Colossians to share the letter that he was writing to them from prison with the people who were at the church in Laodicea. Don't you kind of see in verse 16 a sense of urgency in Paul's uh, command here? You see it there? See that, he writes. See that it is read. In other words, make sure that the church in Laodicea reads this letter too. Here, Paul did not intend for his letters, for his sermons, for his teachings to be hoarded in any one place. Uh, Paul wanted all of the churches to read his letters. He wanted all of the churches and all of the believers to be encouraged and strengthened and built up in the truths of what he was sharing from God's word. And then notice he, he says, this, after, after you read my letter, send it on. S send it on to Laodicea so they can read it, so they can be encouraged as well. And then Paul points out for us in verse 16 that he had written a letter apparently to the church in Laodicea as well. You likewise, he says in verse 16, read the letter from Laodicea. Paul wanted the Colossians to, to read that letter he had written to this other church so that they might be benefited from that, that they might be encouraged, that they might be strengthened. And it just reminds me, folks, that we must help one another to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. That's why part of the reason why the church exists is to help one another. You, you help one another as you participate. You help one another as you come, as you attend, as you commit, as you, as you take part in. And we are, we are a community of believers. The church is a community of believers, not, not a bunch of lone rangers. The, the church is a community. We are a family. We are the body of Christ. And we need the Lord Jesus, and we need one another. That's why we meet. And that's why we meet more than just Sunday morning. That's why we meet on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, and why we have game nights on Fridays every now and then, and why we have breakfast, and why we, why we get together. Some of you might think, well, why, why, do you, why do you meet so much? Well, I don't know about you, but I like to eat. So when we, when we meet, we eat. But when we meet, we fellowship. When we meet, we open God's word. When we meet, we pray with one another and for one another. When we meet, it's part of fellowship. If you're not part of that, you're missing out. You're missing out on what it means to be the family of God. Over this past year, I think we've experienced it more than ever before as we've been locked up inside of our houses and we've not been able to get together with one another and even families have been separated have you noticed that 
And, and when your family was separated over this last year, did it kind of break your heart? Did, did, did you long to be with your family? Some of you said, no, it was the best year of my whole life. <laughs> no. But, you know, I think I can honestly say that if, if you weren't able to be with your children, grandparents, if you weren't able to be with your grandchildren, now I see some heads nodding, yeah, that when the family was separated, it wasn't the family. And when the family's able to come back together and you're able to look at your children, your sons, your daughters, at your grandchildren, you're able to sit around the table, you're able to talk, you're able to share a meal together, you feel like the family is back together. We are part of the family of God. We come together to enjoy each other's company. You might as well go ahead and enjoy each other's company now because guess what? We're going to be spending a lot of time together eventually in heaven. And so let's just go ahead and start right now. I invite you to come. Be a part of all that's taking place outside of just Sunday morning. That's just part of the church. Is that when we gather for Bible study, we gather for a meal, we gather just to pray, we gather to watch a, a movie and play games together. Is that That's the family of God. You need to be a part of the family of God. Oh, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Somebody ought to write a song like that. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. We need each other. I want to benefit from your life experiences. I want to hear about what you've been reading in the Word of God and what God has shown you in your studies of the Scriptures. And I think that we need to hear from each other. We need to hear what everyone else has been reading and learning in their studies and what everyone else has been experiencing as the Holy Spirit works in their lives. We, we need each other, and we need the Lord Jesus. Our spiritual growth depends upon that. Our spiritual success depends upon each one of us worshiping and praying and studying and fellowshipping and working together because we're part of God's family. Look at verse 17. Not only does Paul talk about spiritual growth, but he talks about ministry. Verse 17, Paul says, And say to Archippus, that'd be my fourth child's name, say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Now, who was this guy? Archippus. Who was this fellow? Well, we know that he was a member of of the Colossian church. Paul's writing to the Colossians, and he has a message for Archippus. Apparently, this fellow was a gifted man, and we can kind of assume that he was a young man, that somehow he was, in his giftedness, he had received a calling from God. How many of you have received a calling from God? If you're born again, you have a calling from God. And if you're not born again, God's calling into you is to be born again. To trust the Lord Jesus, we have a calling. This fellow had a calling. He had received a ministry from the Lord, either as a, a teacher or a preacher or a leader or an evangelist. And Paul was simply just affirming this in this fellow's life. There are some that believe that Archippus was the son of Philemon. Philemon, remember, was the, the slave owner of the man named Onesimus. We talked about him last week. Paul said something very similar in verse 17, to a friend of his, his protege, by the name of Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul said to his friend Timothy, Stir up the gift of God which is in you. Stir it up. Get it worked up. Use it. You ever notice that uh, if you ever are making a cake or you're working with something out in the garage, and that if, if you don't stir it up, you ever notice that if you don't stir paint up, what happens to it? Right, is that it begins to separate, it begins to, some of it gets kind of gummy. You know, I, I had uh, some, uh, some wood filler, and it was just a little can, you know, and I opened it up, and it was all nice and fresh, and I used it, closed it up, and a couple years later, I needed some wood filler again. I thought, I got some of that out in the garage. I opened it up, and it went, Poof! you know, I mean, it all dried up. <laughs> it was useless because it hadn't been stirred up. And God wants us to stir up our gift, to allow the Holy Spirit to stir up the gift of the Holy Spirit in your heart and life for the purpose of ministry, for the purpose of sharing the gospel with others, for the purpose of building one another up in the Lord that we might be equipped. And here Paul is encouraging Archippus to devote himself to his ministry, to his calling, 
that which he had received from the Lord to work and minister among those who were in the church in Colossae and in the community of Colossae. Paul would say the same thing to you and me today. Devote yourselves to your ministry. Devote yourselves to your ministry. So the question is, well, what's my ministry? What is your ministry? You ever thought about that lately? What, what is your ministry? Well, let me tell you this. Your ministry from the Lord is unique to you. Your ministry from the Lord is unlike any other ministry. Nobody else has your ministry. Your ministry from the Lord is yours. It's unique. But it includes some common things that we all share. Things like loving and caring for your family. That's part of your ministry. Being concerned about your neighbors, about your employees or your co-workers. Ministering to your church and your church family. Sharing the gospel with those in your neighborhood and in the surrounding communities. Praying for our nation and our leaders and our families and our church and our world. That's part of your ministry. Your unique ministry has those types of characteristics and other things that are unique to you. Devote yourself to your ministry, whatever that might be. From the Lord. And if you're not sure what your ministry is exactly, I, I believe with all my heart, if you pray and you ask the Lord, Lord, I'm not sure what my ministry is. Would you show me what my ministry is? He'll tell you if you're willing to hear it, if you're willing to see it, if you're willing to receive it. Look at verse 18. Paul ends this letter with a very simple statement. This salutation, he writes, by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. You know, up to this point, you kind of picture this. Up to this point, Paul has been dictating his letter. He's been sitting there, and I can kind of see him leaning back and closing his eyes, and he's thinking, and the Holy Spirit's stirring up in his heart, and he's just saying what's coming to his mind. He's saying what's coming to his heart. And one of his friends is there, he's going, could you slow down a little bit? I mean, he's writing as fast as he can write. I don't want to miss a single word that Paul is saying here. He's writing down all of these words, and then at the end, Paul pauses, opens his eyes, looks at his friend, reaches across, and takes the pen out of his friend's hand and writes down this simple sentence, Remember my chains. Remember my chains. Now, why would Paul write that? Well, think about it. As he's sitting there, what's his condition? Remember, he's in prison. He's chained between two soldiers. So if he's chained between two, one on his left, one on his right, guess where his, his hands are, right? There's a chain and a clasp on this hand, on this wrist, and one on this wrist. And when he reaches out to grab that pen, the soldier next to him goes, wakes up. Or he hears... Clink, 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 clink. He hears the chains clanging together, and Paul remembers. He's reminded, oh, yeah, I'm in prison. Oh, yeah, I'm chained up here. Oh, yeah, I can't go anywhere. But God's word can. See, Paul was chained. God's word is not chained. Paul couldn't go anywhere. God's word could go everywhere. Paul could only do so much, God's word can do anything. Isaiah 55, verse 11, we read, So shall my word as it goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. As God's word goes out to people, God's word always accomplishes that which, for which God sends it out. God's word never comes back empty. God sends his word out and it does work that God intends for his word to do. Paul was preparing to send this letter to the church in Colossae. And then he says, and share this letter with others. And for over 2,000 years, think about this. God has preserved this letter for us. We just read it. God has preserved the letter of, Coloss of, the, of Colossians. And God has protected and preserved all of his scriptures for us. 
We have them today. And aren't you glad for that? Aren't you, aren't you glad that we live in a country where we can actually have the scriptures, that, that uh, we can open them and we can read them and not be afraid that somebody's going to come and, and uh, haul you off and put you in jail? That, that time may be coming, friends, so enjoy it while you can. Memorize and read God's word while you can. There may come a day when there will come a knock at the door and you'll open the door and someone say, is going to say, I want all of your Bibles. We're having a bonfire in the street. That day may be coming soon. Are you ready for that day? We need to study, to read, to show ourselves approved unto God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed. God is still speaking to us today through the letter we just read. God is still speaking to us today through his scriptures. How do you know that? Because God's word says so. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than what? Any two-edged sword and able to get right down and divide and open up and separate and show and reveal everything about our lives. God's word is alive today. And we were talking about this the other, the other, the other evening. Have you ever been reading the Bible and you've read through, I don't know, what, whatever the the chapter of the verse, the book was, and uh, all of a sudden something just leaps off at the page, from the page into your eyes. I never saw that before. Well, it's not because God just decided, hey, I'll write this down for Mike's benefit. No, is that it's always been there. But God's word is alive, living, active. God is always speaking to us through his word. But we must take the time to read it. We must take the time to study it, to give attention to God's word, to obey God's word. You know, God's word speaks. God wants to speak to us, but if we're not willing to take the time to read it and to listen, then we're not going to hear a word from the Lord. We all need to hear a word from the Lord. So as we think about these friends of Paul's, do you have anybody in your life that's like these friends? Or let me ask you this. If you were to examine your heart and your life, would you say, that you possess some of these qualities that we've read about? A faithful servant, a, a, a fellow worker, a fellow companion, a fellow prisoner. Do you have somebody in your life that is like that or is that? Do you have a friend like that? Are you a friend like that? Do you have a heart for others? Do you have a heart for the lost? Do you have a heart to grow in your relationship with the Lord? Do you have a heart to see others to come to know the Lord and to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe that would be a decision you would make this morning, is for either God to give you a friend like that or for you to be a friend in somebody's life like that. Maybe there would be some other decision. Maybe you don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus this morning. And as we've been reading about and talking about friends and you honestly consider in your own life, you're not really sure that you've been born again, or you know that you've not. Maybe that's your condition this morning, and your decision today would be to trust Jesus Christ and be born again. How does that happen? Well, the Bible simply says that we need a Savior because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death. We are all under the wages of sin because all have sinned, but God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus, and he gave us his promise that Whosoever believes in him, whosoever places his or her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to save and forgive from sins shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. If you would be willing this morning to humble yourself and come to the Lord Jesus simply and simply tell him, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I have sinned against you, but I believe that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross. And I believe that you can save me from my sins. And even though I don't deserve it, I come to you and ask you to do that. I repent from my sins and my own way of life and turn to you. Forgive me, please. And come into my life and save me from my sins. And then help me to trust you and follow you for the rest of my life. The Bible says that whosoever would call on the name of the Lord, like that with faith, shall be saved. Maybe your decision today would be to, to be saved. Maybe you've walked away from the Lord. You know you're saved, but you're not walking with him. Your decision today would be to come back and begin to walk with the Lord again. And maybe there's some other decision in your life this morning. This is the time of decision.
So pray with me right now, would you please? Every head bowed here and every eye closed in this room and nobody looking around because the decisions that will be made this morning are very personal. Your decision is between you and God. It's not for somebody else and somebody else cannot make a decision for you. Your decision is yours. You must make that decision. And to put the decision off is to make the decision not to decide. So would you trust Christ today? If you're not born again, would you be willing to trust him and to be saved? If you know you're born again, but you've walked away, would you be willing to, to, to admit that and then to renew your, your commitment, your fellowship with the Lord? And maybe if there's some other decision in your life today, a calling that God has placed upon your heart, the need for a friend, uh, the, the need for God to renew something in your life that's broken, for God to show up in a powerful way in your life because of something that is going on there in your life or in your world. The Lord is faithful. Would you trust Him and would you follow Him? Father, as we bow before you this morning and in this room of so many people, there are so many decisions, so many situations, so many details and circumstances, and you know all about them. And so the first calling we know you place upon our heart is to repent of our sin and to be saved. And if there's one here today who's never done that, I pray that would happen this morning. And then, Lord, you call us to walk with you. If there are some here today who've walked away from you, the decision would be to, to, to come back to you and begin walking again, hand in hand. And then there you've placed other callings that, that you have given each one of us a ministry or ministries. And maybe the decision would be for us to renew that commitment to serve you, to serve our families, to serve our church, to serve our communities, to serve you as we faithfully share and as we go, to trust you to do that. So Father, as heads are bowed and eyes closed and we're just quiet here for just a moment and as you listen to the cry of our heart and you pay attention to every decision that's made thank you for hearing us and then help us that even as you are faithful that we would be faithful to you to remember whatever promise or decision we make this morning and to continue to follow you in that so give us the courage right now lord as we deal with things in our lives and even as you call us to maybe step out and to follow you publicly or whatever it would be give us the courage to trust you as re you remind us that you are worthy and that we can trust you with every detail of our lives because you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than what we could ever ask or ever imagine so be exalted in this place lord as decisions are made and as we trust you and follow you this morning i pray in jesus name amen would you stand with me